So just a little bit of uh, background on who I am. Uh, a lot of you know me already, but I'll just go over it real quick. My name is Scott Ashworth. I have a uh, criminal justice bachelor's degree as well as a criminal justice uh, master's degree. I have certification wise, I am a CPP certified, CSSP certified, which is more so geared towards the sports professional network. And then CC certified, that is like a baby beginner's cybersecurity certification. But I'm trying to get, uh, I'm at least trying to speak the language because I do feel that, like I told this table over here, I do feel that cybersecurity is actually going to be owned by physical security soon enough. Because at the end of the day, whoever's breaking into your bank accounts virtually, it's a human being on the other side of a computer. It's not a computer that's doing it itself. But... As far as experience, I actually started my career in security and law enforcement with the Forest Park Police Department. If you all don't know where that is, if you have flown out of Hartsfield Jackson Airport, you have been to Forest Park. I know he knows. It once was a lovely area, but it became a really good place to get training for a police officer who was learning to uh, really learn from the, uh, the, uh, the trenches, if you will. So I spent about a decade with uh, the Forest Park Police Department. I left as the lieutenant over investigations for the department. Uh, and then I got offered an opportunity from Arthur Blank. And when Arthur Blank wants to pay you more money than law enforcement, there's not many answers other than yes. So I joined Atlanta United as the director of security. Uh, it was their first year. Uh, if any of you are Atlanta United fans, their first year went from winning uh, one playoff game to the second year winning every single game known to man, which actually gave me the opportunity to travel the world. Because when you qualify, when you win games in MLS, you actually qualify for games in Costa Rica and Mexico and Honduras. So my off, our off season was not an off season. It was literally just work more and work harder and work in places that you've never been before. But then, uh, after I was with that program for about four years, it became uh, a program that was very much on autopilot. It was something that was very, uh, it started to set standards in Major League Soccer, and it, it was a program that I was really proud of, but at the time it was built, it was running, and I got an opportunity to join another company called Overtime, which is a new age company. I would try to explain it, but it takes about an hour and a half. If you guys are interested, uh, we do actually have an Amazon Prime series. It's called One Shot. It kind of takes you through what overtime is, what we do, and what our successes are. We basically make super athletes for the next generation. Uh, we had two of our young athletes just get drafted, uh, number four and five in the NBA draft, and had a total of six uh, athletes go into the NBA this past year. So uh, it's a really phenomenal program. It actually, it's a, a countrywide program and it's about to go international. Can't give you anything there. Those are some secrets, but it is really growing like a weed and it's an, an awesome opportunity to really build and run their security program. But just to give you a little bit about my professional journey, because no professional journeys are all the same. Not everybody just goes to college and then decides exactly what they want right as they graduate and then do 30 to 40 years before they get on a boat and start fishing. So I actually went to business school. And when I was in business school, I was majoring in marketing. I did three years of business school. About that third year, I started to struggle. Academically, my passion wasn't there. I just, I, I wasn't involved in just invested in the work. And so I really wanted to ask myself what I wanted to do after that. And so I did what I should have done years before. I looked in a mirror and asked myself what my eight-year-old self wanted to do. And so I became a cop. It's as simple as that. No college degree, just stopped college at that point, went to police, and I was lucky enough that the Forest Park Police Department was willing to pay for your college if you wanted to continue while you worked. Now, they weren't going to give you any time off because I went to school from 7 in the morning until 12 in the afternoon and then worked homicides and robberies from 1 until 11 at night. So it's not like they were understanding. They paid for my college, but that was about the extent. And you also had to get an A to get to 100%. So it wasn't, it wasn't all the easiest network. But I was able to get my degree. And once I got my degree, I was able to rise through the police department, get to the rank of lieutenant. But then I was on the precipice of having a family. And if any of you uh, all here from law enforcement or military, any government work, 
I had to make the decision on whether I wanted to do what I loved at the time or make money for a living because it was not happening at that point. So I started to look into the private sector. I looked into the federal and the private sector, and I was actually at a crossroads. I was at a point where I was about to enter the FBI, but I actually got a call from the uh, head of security for AMB Sports Entertainment, which is the Falcons United Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And he offered me the position to be the Atlanta United Director of Security. I didn't know what soccer was at that time. I had no clue. I didn't know what offsides was. I didn't, I, I, for the first year of working there, I kept calling it a game and everybody yelled at me and said it's a match. It took me a year to figure that out. And I still don't say it all the time. But the way that I saw that Arthur Blank invested in it and the way that I saw the city surround it, I figured that this is going to be something amazing. It's going to need a lot of work. It's going to need to build a really good program around security. So I thought, you know what, let's go ahead and let's try that. Awesome. I loved it. Four years. Uh, you know, I got to the, about the end of my time with Atlanta United and the pandemic hit. It's actually an interesting story. The, when every the dominoes started falling, I was in Mexico City. We were playing a match versus one of the most famous uh, teams in Mexico, Club Americas. And it was halftime and I'm looking at my phone and the first thing I see is, is that uh, Adam Silver of the NBA cancels all NBA games. I'm like, all right, that's not good. So then I saw the World Health Organization declares worldwide pandemic. I'm like, that's not good either. And then you see President Trump cancels all travel from Ireland, England, and European countries. I'm in the locker room yelling at a bunch of Argentinian, Mexican nationals, and American soccer players. We're not showering. We're getting on the plane because I don't want to get stopped by F-16s before we get to land in America. That was a day where we got them back. The next day, everything shut down. But 2020, with that kind of pause, gave me another opportunity to go back and get my master's degree. Went back, got my master's degree from Southern, uh, uh, Southern New Hampshire and continued that journey. So that's, that's the kind of my, uh, my maturity through the security industry in a nutshell. And so it doesn't have, it doesn't, what I write here is it doesn't have, it doesn't matter how you get there, just that you get there. And I tell that to people all the time. I have people who approach me, they're like, well, I never got a degree and I'm 35 years old. I have kids, I have this. I'm like, I understand those things. It does not mean that you don't have to get it or that you can't. I promise you, there are programs out there that can really form around your life and your way of living. Um, so I've actually been a real big advocate of this. We are probably one of the only industries that a majority of us are on our second career. And that is a very weird thing when you're coming out of college and you're looking for industries to go into. It's very, you don't want to go into an industry where everybody else has 30 years of experience on their first day and you only have one. So what I try to tell to our younger, uh, our younger students or anybody that's coming out of college, they didn't hear much about corporate security. I was telling this table earlier, I went through three years of business school and I'm, the words corporate security probably got mentioned once and that was in a risk class. The fact that we have such an amazing footprint in business and we are so misrepresented in colleges and universities and business school is unbelievable to me. And had I known about that track of learning or this industry, I might not have gone into law enforcement knowing that my passions actually could have been connected business and security and protecting people, but I didn't know. So that's my goal through these kinds of presentations is to let everybody know that we're there. We're absolutely an amazing career track that people need to know about and need to set their, their sights on as a possible professional track for them. So this chart right here, I pulled this from the uh, ASIS uh, breakdown and it gives a, I'll help you guys out here, make it a little bit bigger. So this gives a breakdown of where people come from in other industries into the security industry. And as you can see, there's no question, military law enforcement uh, is the number one because we have a great framework. Now, if there's any cops in here that are police officers still that are wanting to make the transition to corporate security, let me preface this by saying, you are not a corporate security expert. You are an expert at, police, at policing. You have a fantastic framework for corporate security. 
But on day one, you know nothing about corporate security. That's important for any law enforcement, any military person to know, because I talk to so many cops who just imagine they deserve the gold watch when they retire and they deserve their position as a director of security somewhere. That is not the case. So law enforcement, military, of course, those are the highest. But a lot of the only a lot of the reason that anybody even leaves these to go to to go to our profession is because they actually now are adjacent to it outside of school. Because when you look here, where is it? Where is it? Uh, there is one block. So coming out of college, there's a very low rate of anybody joining the corporate security sector. And a lot of that's the reason I said, this is a, they know what marketing is. They know what accounting is. They know what, uh, you know, risk and, and threat, you know, all this is, they don't know what corporate security is. They don't know what we do. And they look at us and they, when I tell people I work in security, they just assume I wear a polo shirt and I stand next to a door and tell people to stop when they come to a stadium. And they have no idea the depths of which we actually are integrated into companies and what we do for them on a large scale. So that's what I'm trying to change and what this presentation, a lot of it is supposed to do is reinforce to people that this is a rewarding career that many don't see, but need to be able to see. So of course, here are, the, here are your kind of entry level positions. So people thinking about that, that same statement I just made where, you know, I'm a guard and I'm just standing at a door. That's not what this is. When you enter into this, this sector and you don't have law enforcement experience, maybe you just graduated high school, maybe you just graduated college. These are the types of uh, level of uh, positions that you're gonna wanna go after. Your advisors, your security officers, your investigators, your operations assistants, a lot of jobs where you can actually learn from those who are in a position higher than you is what really needs to happen. Getting those mentors, learning in on the job. We all know, I went to what? It's actually Georgia. I went to 10 weeks of law enforcement training. It's ridiculous. They send me out there with a gun with 10 weeks of training. But I went through 10 weeks of training and the moment I hit the streets, I threw that book away because it didn't mean anything. Yeah, I knew what 16521 was, but I didn't know what it meant when I got hit in the face and then had to figure out what it was. So you learn real quick on the streets what it really is and that the education is great to have, but you need the actual application of, of, of expertise, which you learn through real life experience. So these are the course, these are the kinds of positions that people need to look for. But like I said, in secure, in the business world, nobody's teaching them about this. So everybody, when they think of, oh, I'm going to go into security, I'm just going to start as a security guard. No, you can be an investigator specialist. You can be an advisor to a CSO. It doesn't matter how you get it. You can get in at the, at the uh, operational level. Of course, then that leads us to our management director. This is, is really a tough area right here because this is when you start to battle your, your, your law enforcement partners, right? So if you're going out for a management or a director position, you may be somebody who has gone through college, you've got a great degree, you have a great business acumen, you've actually learned from some of the top in the industry, but then you're going up against a guy who was the uh, retired ASAC of the FBI for the Washington DC office. I mean, it's difficult. You actually probably have more corporate security experience than that person does because he mainly worked with, I don't know, maybe he was assigned to white collar crime and he knows how to dissect a bank account, but doesn't know how to tell the C-suite we need $100 million in this purchase. So this is where it becomes a little bit difficult, but if you can show your ability through interviewing and through talking to your peers and through uh, showing your quality of work from those lower levels, police officer or not, you can get to this point and you can become a leader. And then of course you have your executive. How many people in here are a CSO? All right, good. <laughs> CSO, of course, your high powers, your your your, level, your highest level decision makers. Those are the ones that are in the office with the CEO, with the CFO. They're the ones that are pushing the big initiatives for technology, for cost spending, for uh, headcounts, stuff like that. These are the decision makers. That is the goal of somebody. A lot of times when people are graduating college and they're thinking about their career, they're not thinking about, oh yes, I wanna be 
uh, a marketing associate. No, they're thinking about, I want to be the head of the marketing for PepsiCo or for Coke or for this. So to give a younger individual coming out of college or that's looking for a career change, their ultimate goal, it's important to show them that we actually have people sitting at the table. Now, don't get me wrong. It is very misrepresented across the board in a lot of companies. There should be a, a chief security officer sitting at the C-suite table every single time, not always. But the ones that do have it, have them sitting there, that's, your, that's the dream of the person that wants to come into this industry that's really ambitious. You give them that ability to see something that's big and that is really attainable if they focus and they go through these other levels. I think that's really important to show. And then the security industries. I don't have to go over with you guys. We're probably represented. We probably have at least 10 uh, industries represented in this room. We are everywhere. It doesn't matter. The Romans had security 2,000 years ago. Every company needs security. Nobody is stopping the threat. Nobody's stopping threatening people or threatening businesses or threatening to take people's money. That is actually, I would go say, it's on the rise right now. It's becoming easier and easier. I just got to send you an email that says, uh, the Prince of uh, Kuwait is actually my, my uncle. And then 50 people will send me $25,000. But we're represented in every single industry you can imagine. And if there is a business that doesn't have us involved in it, I guarantee they are one dropped ball away from bringing somebody like us into their organization. So certifications. There's a lot of people that go back and forth on certifications. A lot of people think that uh, companies are certification mills. What does it matter if I know what I'm supposed to and I go in and I operate and I do my job well, what does it matter if I have CPP behind my name? Well, I like to call it the, uh, the, the no factor. If you're trying to be competitive for jobs, whether it be that director of security job, that CSO job, that even that line level job with somebody else that just came out of college, how does the person across from you who's never met you before know that you know what you're doing? They just have to take your word for it, don't they? Well, CPP or any of these go a long way in, in providing that proof that you know what you're talking about, at least on a framework level. My example that I like to push is, is let's say that you have a heart defect and that heart defect is gonna kill you tomorrow unless you get surgery. You have the option of picking from doctor one or doctor two. They're twin brothers. Went to the same high school, went to the same college, they had the same exact grades in, in college. They are the same person, but one of them has a uh, certification from the American Medical Association and the other one does not. Who do you pick? Absolutely. freaking lutely Option three, what's that? Just uh, DNR, just, you know what? It's been nice, it's been sweet. I've got my plot picked out. I'm <laughs> Hey, there's there's definitely more than more than three options because you can also go down to you know you can go down to some shady place in in uh, Honduras and they can do it too. I wouldn't say they're the greatest, but but one or two that's what sets you apart. You're going into an interview and you're going into an interview. I always say this: there's nine hundred thousand active cops out there. Nine hundred thousand. Actually, you are one in a million if you were a police officer. Because then you have to factor in how many are already retired and already have police officer status. They're just not actively working. When you go in there and you have your resume and it says, I was a police officer and I enforced the laws of so-and-so and so-and-so, and so, I wrote tickets, I, I did reports. You are literally not standing out at all. But when you go and you actually apply what you learned in law enforcement and then show how you can, you can effectively articulate how that works in the security industry by getting a CPP, that sets you apart. You are then the diamond in the rough and you are one in a million. You are now that officer who understands that when I come out of this, I'm not just ready made for corporate security because I was a police officer. You are telling them, I have the framework. If you give me the resources, I'll build an incredible foundation. I will build on that foundation and it'll be an incredible investment on your part. So that's why I say certifications are really important. It also kind of teaches you jargon. When I got out of law enforcement, there's a lot of verbiage that I didn't know from the corporate side that I'm using law enforcement terms. And people look at me like I'm crazy when I use law enforcement terms. And we use the idea of uh, trying to convey to them a threat through law enforcement terms, and they don't see this every day. So when they hear it, they're like, oh, he's just being an extremist. Well, the CPP actually helped me out 
learning the words and the way to articulate to my leaders that I need this because of this risk and it affects it because of this, this dollar amount. Because you start saying money, you could say 15 people might get hit by a truck, but then you say, but that's going to cost us 15 million. They're like, all right, let's look into this technology. So I liked the journey just because it helped me guided track on learning a couple of things I needed to, to really start to uh, go down the path of learning more and more. Uh, this is just, this is something that I believe solely in. And it goes back to what people imagine when I say I'm in security. We're more than intimidating wardens, cautiously watching doors with an earpiece draping down our necks. We're planners, innovators, leaders, and most importantly, we are strategists. We do so much that people don't see. We are hidden. We are behind the curtain. We are Oz. And this is why it is even more of a struggle for people to understand that we are a part of business because with cameras getting tiny and getting more functional and with weapons detection systems getting a lot more uh, throughput with no, uh, with very little intrusion, with access controls, reading your biometric eyes before you, you don't even have to have a key card anymore. People don't even notice we are there, but we are there more and more. It's insane. And so I always go back to it, you know, millions of employees pass by our works of art and don't stop to pay attention to them because we actually intentionally go out of our way to camouflage it. They drive through gates. That's just normal now. They drive, they drive past holly bushes. Little did they know that instead of putting up a fence, you know, we actually just put some holly bushes out there because I actually know like 10 criminals that'll climb a fence. I know absolutely none that'll try to climb a holly bush because it's ridiculous. It'll end up on uh, YouTube as a joke because they're going to be screaming and hollering their friends, even though they're criminals too, are going to film it. and It's going to get like, so people don't know that though. Uh, you drive around barriers that we do strategically so that people have to go through certain areas and checkpoints and whatever, but they don't even realize it. They park under bright lights that we make sure has the perfect shadow that nobody can ever have lurk in the darkness and wait for you. They don't understand that concept. We, you know, they walk by multiple cameras that they can't even see anymore. I, I would imagine there's probably a camera in here, but can't see it. But people understand that. So they're not seeing them. And then you use the, your badge to get into access buildings. Like I said, I lock all this other stuff. You don't even have to bring anything out. It just sees your face. It recognizes it. It opens the door for you. That kind of stuff. They first think that they've met security when they meet that guard in the lobby, but I have no idea. They just passed by six other security engineered things just to get to that point. That's why I am trying to amplify what we do, because not only does business school not do it, but we're the best at hiding in the light. This is the example I always use going back to really just basic septed uh, and understanding of, of crime prevention through environmental design. Anybody that walks by these two houses is not thinking security. They're just thinking these are two different houses. This is just a house that has less landscaping, but this is all intentional. The bushes are here so that you can't see in the house. You can't tell if anybody's home, what they're doing, the security. You know, you've got these right here. These are just obstacles. If I run out your house with TV and a cop car pulls up, the last thing I want to do is, is, is make it a hurdle event. Then you have the fence. If you have a locked fence, I always tell people, if you have a locked fence around your house, now it's inconvenient for one burglar. It's got to be a team of two because if they're going to steal, because TVs don't come at 50 inches anymore. It's 100, it's 150. And if you're going to steal a 150 inch TV, you better have somebody to hand it off to because you're not climbing a fence and then bringing it over. So it's these little things that people don't understand that we do that pointing this stuff out to them is, is mind blowing. The one, one of my favorite things is the big red balls outside of Target, where everybody just thinks that's made for teenagers to sit on and loiter. That's not why they're there. You, you damn sure can't put an F-150 through the front of that building because you're going to hit that big red ball and it's going to look silly. But people don't know that. But it's great. It's a great uh, thing. It's, people take pictures on it. It's, it's advertising. So people understanding what they're seeing every day is actually us doing our job really brings them to appreciate what we're doing and how well we do it so that and and honestly to bring them to our underlying mission which is to make it harder for bad people to hurt people we protect and that's i guarantee you that is a more passionate 
enterprise than accounting, than marketing, than anything else. You have more of a purpose in a profession than anybody else in business. And that just kind of, this is exactly what I just covered. You know, we really, our job is, is to make everybody feel protected, but we want to make sure that they pass through and don't even realize they're being protected. So we're out of sight, we're out of mind. I'm trying to amplify it and be a bullhorn to tell people that we exist. Let's see if we can, I'll turn this up. This is kind of one of my favorites. And as we all know in security, if you're going to go into a, if you're going to go into a life of security, you better be able to not tell people your wins and your losses. We are the CIA of business because we're protecting the brand. We're protecting the people. And to do that, people have to stay ignorant to a certain extent. This is one of my favorite scenes from a movie that sums it up best. So what's awesome about our industry is we're often the ones in the know. Everybody else is wondering, why did that person get fired? Why did this happen? Why is this policy going into place? What did that person do that really made the CEO mad? We all know this stuff. We're the ones that investigated it. We're the ones that have the insight. We're the, there are stories that I have from people's favorite teams that will never be heard because it's just my role. That's just what it is. But you have to be able to live with that. But you also, that's very cool to be on the side of, you're gonna have this very sensitive information. You're gonna have to make real life or uh, real quick decisions with really hectic situations, but be composed about it and do what's best for the company and the people around you. And this is, this is one of my favorites. So throughout, I talked to a bunch of college students and they always told me that, they wanted to be somewhere where they're making money for the business. They feel like it's not, they feel like security is just kind of a, a necessary operational movement. I hate that. I, this is my opinion because people can go back and forth all day long. I don't think security departments are money pits at all. Not at all. And the reason I say that is because at its most basic level, profit is cost out plus revenues in. And this chart right here shows you litigation over the years to 2021. It's not going down. If you're able to stop your company, if you're able to buy a $250,000 piece of equipment and then somebody sues you and that equipment is able to adjudicate you of a $2 million claim of, of uh, carelessness, you have just made the company 170 or you've made them a million seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars profit the company won't see it that way the company will send an email telling them that their litigation team is absolutely amazing that it wasn't the smoking gun it was the delivery of the smoking gun that got them off but we did like security does that so we are a profit generator is a lot of times they can't see the profit if you were in law enforcement before you'll know this pain as well if you're sitting in front of a building all night writing reports and nobody breaks into that building, nobody knew that a guy driving down the street had planned for three weeks to break into that building, but it did not get broken into because you were there. You cannot prove that to people in your, as much as you tell your chief, you're just sitting around doing nothing to actually stop crime. He's not gonna believe you. Nobody in the community is gonna believe you, but you actually did it. That's the hardest part of our job is to be able to show people our value and how we've actually stopped that. So, I mean, I go back to the passion piece all the time. There's very few professions where people can actually go back to and find a purpose. I mean, purpose is what humans are, are driven on, right? It's what gets us up in, in the morning, whether it's because your purpose is to make a good life for your kids, your purpose is this. But this, our career actually stops people from getting hurt. It makes it more difficult for bad people to exploit good people. It doesn't matter if you're a director of a security uh, company where security guards are calling in suspicious activity, if you own a camera company that makes it easier for them to see it, if you employ robots or you're a company that makes robots that helps it easier and makes it a lot more efficient, you are helping to stop people from getting hurt. That is one hell of a purpose 
And that's why I push this, this career choice to anybody, especially younger individuals, because a lot of times when you get into a career and you're 25 years old and you realize I'm bored at work, I don't like this, it's because you don't have a true purpose in that work. And so that's why this is one of the things that I want to amplify our career and hopefully bring in more young applicants. I'm not trying to water down the pool to the point where cops and federal agents can't get jobs because I guarantee you they're qualified to. It's just I want to give a different demographic a lot more of an opportunity to actually bring in younger ideas or different ideas, ideas they got from a marketing degree or a computer science degree, whatever it may be. Different ideas are actually the backbone of real innovation because if you have everybody's thinking the same thing, you're going to do the same thing every time and you're, re you're predictable. So, and of course, if you're unsafe at work, I'm pretty sure you probably aren't as productive. So 